Hi everybody. In this video, we're going to learn how to use the Anchor Framework to speed up writing your Solana smart contracts. My name is Josh, and this channel's mission is to accelerate the road transition of blockchain technology. Cheesy introduction aside, let's talk about the Anchor Framework. So what is the Anchor Framework? Anchor is a, is a framework for quickly building secure Solana programs. Specifically, what it handles is it handles the serialization and deserialization of instruction and account data. If you've seen some of my past videos, you'll know what we're talking about. But for those first time viewers, Solana works by having specific custom data, both on the network on the, or the on-chain code and the client code or the off-chain code. And for th the data to talk to each other, you need to be able to serialize it and deserialize it as you send the data across the network. So that's one thing. And the second thing Anchor handles for you is handles basic security checks. And we'll go into more into this later. But one thing we should always do when handling smart contract is to make sure that the transaction we're doing actually is a legitimate transaction and not some malicious party. And Anchor helps take care of some of that for you. And now, as always, big thanks to our sponsor, myself, because no one else will sponsor me. Um, on a serious note, I try to make these videos as independent as they can, but they do reference some of the videos I made in the past. Uh, check out my playlist in the description below to get the full details of everything. And that aside, as always, disclaimer, this is not development advice. If you write code that gets used to it, it is not my problem. It is yours. Now, let's get started. So setting up is pretty straightforward. Um, we're essentially just going to go over the anchor minimal example uh, with some of our own little plot twists to match the implementation of our previous videos. Um, but I included the link to the setup instructions. I'll also add it in the description below. I assume we're all, we can all handle uh, installing software at this point. Um, but the four things we need to install is Rust, Solana, Yarn, and Anchor. Uh, Yarn. If you've been following along my previous videos, the only big change you need to install is you need to install Anchor with npm. Yarn will be relevant in actually building the project because it seems like every project in Solana uses Yarn. And of course, uh, we'll be using the Anchor example project that's provided by Project Theorem. And I also include a description to the GitHub project, but we just run the command git clone to get the project. So before we get started, uh, there are some anchor commands that I think we really need to talk about just as a FYI. We're not going to use the first command, which is anchor in it. Uh, this will essentially create a new anchor project. We're not going to be doing that. We're just going to be using an existing project, but this, the command would essentially just create a new project for you as the, you might suspect, which would include everything you need to run a uh, hello world program, essentially, including tests, which is always nice. We have the anchor build command, which essentially just builds and compile all of your code that you've written in. Then there's Anchor Deploy, which according to documentation, builds and deploy your code to the Solana network, which in our instance right now would be localhost since we're not gonna be actually deploying anything. We have Anchor Test, which runs our unit tests that we've written. Um, it also builds and deploy. And of course, there's a lot of other commands. So if you wanna see them all, just type anchor-h, or you can also visit the documentation in the link I've added here. Now, so now we know a bit more about how to use the anchor commands. Let's actually talk about how to write an anchor code. And so this will actually be the code that we'll be going over, the basic one example. And you see we have this massive amount of code. Oh, it's probably not that big, like 40 lines, but it's confusing. There's a lot of attributes and things that we don't understand. So let's break it down one by one. So, so breaking it down. So let's first talk about the program module, which is the mod basic one that you see right here. So on the very top, you see this uh, program annotation, uh, this program attribute. And essentially it's what Anchor uses to define what a Solana smart contract or a program is. And it just handles some of the background tasks to make these easier for us. So now we have that annotation and each of the function inside of the module is essentially a instruction. For those new to this video, instructions essentially are just individual transactions that you can make to the contract to do something with your account. And for those who don't know what accounts are, accounts are essentially just state data that is stored on the Solana network. But in previous videos, you've seen that we essentially just had one massive helper function and then we extracted the data that we got from the network and then handled each instructions independently. What's nice about Anchor is that we just define each function per instruction that we have. So let's talk about what we get actually in the data. The first parameter we get is the context. 
And essentially all a context is, is it's a container that holds the account data that we defined. Um, if we go back quickly, we'll go over to this, but you see that there's this initialize parameter that we pass in, that's defined down here. And after the context, we actually have a unlimited amount of variables that we can take in. And these are just custom instruction data that we send across the network. I also include the documentation to the context for those who are curious. And that's essentially what we need to know about each function. So now that we know more about the program module, let's look a bit more into the account data types that we are passing in. So let's, let's, so let's dive into our accounts. We need to find one struct for each of the instruction that we want to handle for our functions. And each struct should derive a account. And what this means is that uh, the struct would inherit the account trait or the accounts trait. And accounts will just include you know, extra de implementation detail that Anchor uses that we don't have to worry about. Now diving into what data goes into the structs, the intention for each of these structs is that we would include data that we need to use for each of our instruction. And if the parameter we include in our struct includes a account type, I know there's a lot of accounts, there's the accounts that we derive and then there's the, an actual account to the data structure. Um, but for each of these account types that we include, we need to add this attribute, this account attribute, which specifies the behavior that we must expect from account. And if we actually dig into some of the parameters that we include, we have the init, which is the first command. And this essentially is to create the account. Something we have not seen in the previous video is actually the process of creating account. When writing native Solana code, it usually just creates the account for us and we don't need to do anything. In Anchor, we can actually take control of that and do some customization ourselves if we want to. So that's what this initialize struct is in the initialize function that we have implement that is implemented over here. Um, this is essentially just creating our account for the first time. So when creating an account, that's what the init is for, to signify that this is us creating this specific my account type. Uh, other data that we need to include is who is the payer, because we need to essentially pay rent, is what it's called, to store our account on the Solana network. And we need to specify who the signer is, or essentially the wallet. And we dictate that the signer is the user, which is this parameter down here, which is the, the field user that is of type signer. And essentially, uh, one of the nice things about Anchor and security is that a Anchor will automatically check for us that the user ID that we pass in is valid and some other checks. And it's moving on from payer, we also have space. So one thing about working in Solana REST is that everything has to be extremely space efficient. We have to allocate a certain number of bytes essentially to our code. And in this case, uh, we allocate uh, eight, uh, eight plus eight, 16 bytes. And the reason we have eight plus eight is the first eight, we always have eight because that includes the hash of the account essentially. And then the next eight is the size of the data that we're storing, which is from the my account, as you can see right here. And my account is defined down here. Uh, my account includes only one thing, which is a data type, which is a U64. And, and a U64 is essentially a number that has 64 bits long. And we know eight bits goes into one byte. So this my account data struct is a is of size eight bytes. So that's how we define our eight plus eight. So that's how we define space. Another account type is mute, uh, which you can see us use right here on line thirty three. And what it says is that we can modify the data stored on the account. So that's what this account attribute is. It's just a nice hook, essentially you can think of that Anchor uses to run code in the background for us that we don't have to worry about. Which, might I add, one nice thing is it actually verifies that all the accounts you use is actually owned by the Solana program, which is important for security purposes. So moving along, we see that there's this apostrophe info variable. We don't really know what that is, but essentially the apostrophe just indicates that the, vari that the variable we're using is a lifetime variable. You can look more into that if you're curious, we're not going to get into that. And from my understanding, and don't call me on this one, this info actually represents a account info class. And I'm just going to open it up because it'll be real important to see. Uh, well, wrong link, but an account info is an error struct that contains all of these types. The most important one is going to be data because this is where we will be storing our custom data. But we can see a lot of helpful information like this is our who, who the, the pub key of the owner of this account, 
the key of the specific account and so on and so forth. So that's what it is. And going back to our presentation. All right, so now we know what an account info is. Let's actually talk about the account that I accidentally opened up earlier. So an account is another struct that was created by Anchor to help essentially wrap the data that the user is passing into it. But so let's take a quick look into what account is. And a account is, like I mentioned earlier, a wrapper around the account info, which includes information about your account, like the owner, the rent, and so on and so forth, that verifies the program ownership and deserializing underlying data into the REST type. And this is what we were talking about. Uh, Anchor handles some of the processing work for you. So for example, if you look at the code, so if you read this basic functionality, uh, I won't read the whole thing for you, you can read it yourself. I probably actually should have uh, increased this. But if you read the code itself, uh, some of the things it checks is it checks if the account info owner, which uh, if you look at the account info again, it has this owner class or owner field. It checks to see if the, the account info, the owner is equivalent to the owner of the program. And it does some other things like check if there is any rent left in the account so that the so that everything is valid. And if you can dig into it, I'll include this in the description below. So that's what account info is. It's just a wrapper. And you can see that this account takes in two types, uh, or it's a, it's a generic that takes in two types. There's the account info, which includes all of the basic information about the account. And it contains a my account struct, which is a, essentially custom data. And if you look down here, my account, which you also know we annotated with this um, account attribute, but this my account is a, is essentially just custom data that you want to store on the salon network for your uh, user's account. And so in the basic example, they just call it a data. If you watched the previous video, we called it counter, and that's essentially what we're going to use this for. So, and just for completeness, uh, we'll go over some of the rest of our data. We have this user field in our struct, and that's a signer. A signer is essentially just another data type to represent a wallet that is going to pay for the creation of the account. Uh, and then we're going to have the system program, which is something else we include to create the program. I won't worry about the details too much. I just copy and paste. Uh, this this is just setup work that we need to have for the initialize instruction that we every user has to start. If you look at an actual instruction that we need to find, such as update, that's actually much simpler. We just include the account data that we want to interact with, which is the exact copy of what we have up here. Notice that we don't need to have the init attribute anymore because it already exists. All we include is this uh, mute attribute because we want to modify the data or update it specifically. And to reiterate, we don't use this my account struct uh, directly in our instruction. It is just custom data that we're passing into these uh, initialize and update, which is the actual instruction that we're passing into our code. If you take a look right here, we see we use initialize right here inside our initialize function and we use update inside our update function. And that's roughly everything you need to know about creating a Solana smart contract using the Anchor framework. So now that we have, know how to write one, let's actually go through a practical example. So we're, we're going to convert our existing basic one uh, project that we've cloned from the Serum Anchor example. And, but don't worry, I'll go through the whole example so you can follow along. But we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to modify that example to match our previous video where we sent a, where we wrote a Solana smart contract that essentially had four, well, three instructions. Well, we don't count initialize, but four instructions. We're going to have a initialize, which we're going to set our count, or in this code, it's gonna be called data. We're gonna set our data to be zero. We're gonna send a increment instruction, which will increase our count by one. We're gonna have a decrement instruction, which decrease the count by one. And finally, we're going to have a set instruction, which will set our count to be whatever value we pass it. So let's get started with the code. So the first thing we need to do is we need to actually clone the project. I've already done it in my local library, but you know, let's just go through this together. So if we go back to my notes. There's this get clone function. Um, you know, don't trust me. I'm just a random guy on the internet. I recommend you um, go into the GitHub repo itself, 
and then getting the command from there. But let's pull up my command prompt. Now we're going to our WSL instance, and for those who are first time watchers, I have to ask you to go look in the past video to learn how you can set up WSL. Um, WSL is just a Windows Linux operating system, uh, subsystem that we connect to. You see the squiggly line, so we can go to our root. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of existing code. I'm just going to, and as you can see, I already cloned it over here. So let's go back to our CD video. We've been using this directory for all of our videos. So we're just going to do another get clone here. And I'm just going to clone the whole anchor protocol. And why did I get that? All oh, right, get clone, get clone. All right, let's try that again. We do get clone. All right, so now we've cloned our repo. We see that anchor exists. So you can see anchor. And you look at the content, you see that it's everything in the getter repo. So now that we have that, let's open up our Visual Studio code, which I will pull up over here. And we're going to connect to our project that we just created through VS Code. And, and once again, uh, look through the Hello World program, I believe, I made that talks about how we would set up VS Code to be able to connect to your WSL instance. But essentially, all I think all we need to do is just open folder. Okay, that's not going to be correct. So we're going to, so we're going to click on this button on the bottom left corner to open a WSL instance a WSL instant using our remote WSL extension that we downloaded. Close this. Now if you click open folder again, there we go. And we just type the path to our uh, repo that we created. So it's video and anchor. And now inside this project, there's actually multiple examples that we could have gone through, but, but I'm just going to open the root directory. So I click okay. And now if you see on the left corner in this column, we have our we are in the correct directory. And if we open examples, we see our the, the example projects. Uh, the ones we are care about, curious about is basic one. And we just go open this and we click on lib and we see the example code. Now let's also open up the test file because we're going to need that later. Now I'm going to use control B to close that window for space. Here's our anchor code that we went over, written in REST, of course. So now let's actually dive into the details of the code. I only pointed out the, the definition of our function. We've never actually talked about what the code itself did. Um, I mean, I don't think it's too complex to understand, but let's go through it for completeness. So in our initialize function, um, we're past that initialize struct that we defined down here. Um, and the nice thing about, and one thing you'll notice is that we actually never use the user or system program. Anchor handles all the verification and everything for us. Um, one thing I will actually mention that's very powerful is that this code will only trigger if everything is successful. If we have any problem with serializing and deserializing our data that is shown over here, uh, we'll never actually run initialize or update for that matter. If there is a security vulnerability that we encounter, like the account doesn't actually belong to the Solana program, we would also not execute this code. Anyways, so we have this initialize and the return type is a result. Uh, we talked about this in previous videos, but a result is a Rust type that is essentially an enum that gives you an okay or an error, I believe. Think of it kind of as a promise. If you're familiar with JavaScript, you can either get a success or a fail. In this video, we're not going to worry about any error cases. So everything is returned of an okay. But if you look in our code, we have the context that was passed to us and essentially what line 10 does is with the context and if you open up the uh, the link to documentation you'll see what fields include it you can reference the accounts it says accounts but it's actually just that one account that we passed in so inside accounts we can talk to my account which is another layer of interaction <laughs> that contains the most important part the metadata that we have that stored in the my account struct. So this is how we get the my account um, variable. And important to note that we have this uh, ampersand mute because we want to update the value. And in Rust, if you want to update a data structure, we need to include this uh, mute symbol and get a reference to it. So in initialize, 
all we're doing is we're given custom data and we'll don't worry we'll look at the client side to see how uh, it's passed in but we get this custom data and we just set it to the data type which as you see we define right here it's just a integer of u64 and after that we just return a okay result because everything worked out great for those who came from my past videos, you'll kind of notice how simple this is. Uh, there was no serialization or deserialization that's being done with the data. Uh, remember how we had to create an array and then pack it with the bytes to represent the data? That was not fun. But you can see we don't do it here, and that's because Anchor does it all for us, and so we don't have to do anything. Anyways, so let's actually implement the code that we've been talking about. So we're going to have four things, remember? it's We're going to have initialize, set, increment, and decrement. So initialize, we just want to set the data to be zero. So we just set this to be zero, and we can just remove any of the custom data that we're sending. Update, or we call it set at this. Actually, you know what? Let's just keep everything called update. We know what it is. Uh, increment, we're not going to use update anymore. We're going to call it increment. Now, technically, we could use it because we're not really changing anything. But I think it's best to always define a custom struct for each of our function in the case that we ever want to change anything in the future. We don't want to break our existing code. Anyways, so we create our increment and our decrement uh, instruction, and we don't really need to pass any custom data because we're just going to increment by one or decrement. So plus equal one, minus, minus equal one. Uh, one interesting thing that we're, I will point out that we're not going to catch is that this decrement can actually crash the code because if, if, if we go to a negative number because a unsigned 64 is only positive numbers but we're not gonna worry about it all right so we define our increment and decrement function now we need to actually define the instruction that goes with it and it's nothing complex essentially we just copy paste our update and we just call it a new struct. It's literally the exact same copy and paste. And that's all we need to do to create our Solana program. And if, if you watched any of the past video, you'll know it was not straightforward to get to this point. So you can see the power of anchor right now. All right, so let's go back to our slide to see what instructions we need to run. Okay, so how do we deploy our code? Here is the instructions. Technically, uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to run the Solana keygen that creates a wallet essentially on our on our um, local instance. Uh, I technically don't think we need this because we, in, at least in our example, we actually never use a wallet. We just kind of define custom wallet in our tests. But uh, you know, if that's not the case, if that doesn't work for you, you probably have to run this command. Anyways, so we need to navigate to our basic one on our Visual Studio code as a built-in terminal for those unaware. We need to yarn install to install everything in our project. Anchor build to build our project. And then we need to run this Solana address, this command essentially, to get the address of our smart contract. This is very important um, because that's where our code is located at. And we need to include this address in our um, declare ID macro that we've actually never talked about. We kind of just passed over it. And then we just build again with this new ID. And then finally we run anchor deploy to deploy our sorry contract on our local network. So let's do that. I'm gonna move this to the left. So if you go to view and terminal, we'll open this uh, terminal to our code. And then we go to CD examples, uh, tutorial, basic one we do a yarn install to install all of our dependencies okay so now that we have that we can do an anchor build and this builds our solana program it, it actually does something else that we'll look into later uh, but it, it creates something called an idl which is something that the front end uses to actually communicate with us without having to define our front end code it, it's very handy because in our past video we saw that we had to manually recreate all of our data types on the front end by using this idl file that we created we don't need to do anything at all so we just write one code on our solana program and it can be used everywhere all right so it's built so now we have this new key pair right here that displays the address to our program if we actually look it up it's this array of numbers and we need to convert that array into actual uh, valid numbers 
And that's when we run the command that was mentioned in the presentation, uh, Solana address dot K dash K, and you give it the address of the key pair that was created, which is in this instance, this specific uh, line of address. All we need to do now is copy the code or the address, go back into our lib, paste the value and do another Solana build or anchor build. All right, now it's done. We have the program. Now we can do the anchor deploy, which then would the uh, build and deploy our contract to the Solana network. And you see right here, our program ID is the exact same thing we mentioned. So that essentially that's all we need to do to deploy our program onto the Solana network. Now the question is how do we actually test it? One of the benefits and power of Anchor is that it automatically provides a front end interface that we can use. Uh, if you've seen the past videos that we've made, we had to recreate our account basically in a JavaScript equivalent, but now with Anchor, uh, what Anchor does is it takes this IDL that we've created or anchor creates we read it and then that will allow us to interact with the same interface that we created on rust in javascript and i'll probably move my head over here there we go we'll take a look at this but if you look at the code briefly uh, all you do is you read the generated ideal file that rust provides we need to actually put this somewhere and then we convert that into a, a json object and then from the helper libraries that Anchor provide, we also need to give it the, the, the program address. And then with these two information, we can create, use this Anchor program uh, helper function. We give it the IDL and we give it the address to our program and it will create the uh, a client essentially to talk to our smart contract with the expected variables. And so with program, we call it, we can call something like program.rpc.initialize. Uh, initialize being the function that we implemented in the basic example. In this specific example, initialize actually didn't take in any specific parameters. So nothing was included uh, for us. That's not the case. Uh, we'll look into that later, but that's roughly what needs to be done to talk to our smart contracts. So relatively simple, I admit, skipped some stuff such as obviously creating the wallet or connecting to the correct network, but this is roughly what needs to be done. And before I move on, let's actually look at the IDL files that we created. So back on Visual Studio, if we open the Explorer, let's see if the target folder shows up. Okay. Oh yeah, actually here it is. So you see there's a target folder. We go to IDL, we look at basic one JSON. And then let's remove this. And what this is essentially is this JSON object that represents the accounts and then the instructions that we send across the network. So remember, we have our initialize and update instruction, and that's what we see here. So in our instructions, we have an array of objects, JSON objects. There's two of them. There's initial, uh, probably four. There's initialize, there's update, there's increment, and then there's the decrement. And so if we look at this code, initialize, if we look at the accounts, we see that there are the three types that we specified, my account, user, and system program. If we look at update, and this is the interesting part, um, in our update, if we call in our libs, how we define over here, uh, we take in one type, which is the my account, which you see right here. And in this args, we take in, uh, this data that's u64. If we look back in our update function, we have our uh, update instruction that we define. And we also have the arguments, which is our data u64. Now, as you imagine, if we had more arguments that we took in, they would have appeared over here because this is a array of arguments. In our increment and decrement case, we don't have any arguments because we didn't use anything over here. So that's what this IDL is. And what the front end anchor library we use does is it converts this IDL into helper functions that we can call, such as this initialize code right here. And it will make the request to the network and we don't have to do anything. Now, moving on, running this code and testing is actually kind of painful. We have to read the file. We have to get the smart contract address and so on and so forth. So the smart guys and gals at Anchor did a uh, service to us by creating a concept called Workspace. And that's used to simplify the test. One thing to know about Workspace is that it only works locally with the Anchor text, test command, and it can't be used in any real code, uh, unfortunately. 
And it's also important to note that there is this file called the anchor.toml, tomo file. And in there, we need to find the network that our test is deployed to and the address to it. We need to update that anchor.tomo file with our program address. Now, we actually look at how we use it. It's very straightforward. You really just call anchor workspace dot the name of your file, your project. And that gives you the program and you just do a program dot RPC dot initialize. So very powerful stuff. Um, if it ever changes, you don't need to worry about it. The workspace has the latest change. So with that understanding out of the way, let's actually start writing our tests. The so oanchor projects automatically come with a test directory. Uh, tests are written in JavaScript using the Mocha testing framework. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I recommend just looking it up. It's not too difficult, I'd say. Um, it's just a nice way of writing verbose tests. And of course, there's always examples we can follow, so that's not hard. Just a reminder again, we need to upgrade our anchor.tomo file with our new program address, otherwise the test isn't going to work. And to run our test, we just run anchor test. Uh, we I did some testing, and it's like it's, it seemed like we had to manually do a anchor deploy to build our Rust code if we decide to make any changes there. Otherwise, the test would still be stale. According to the documentation, anchor test should build, deploy, and run the test, but that wasn't the case for myself when I run it at the making of this video. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Um, I will say though, that if you were to update the test and you run an anchor test, that change would happen automatically. So you don't need to do any building there. That's good to know. All right, so back on to the test. Um, we already have our code. It's pretty straightforward. We just want to test our four uh, code over here. Um, our test file, as you can see, is in the same directory of basic one. Uh, it's in this test directory. We just open the basic one S. And so let's take a quick peek of this code. Uh, so this is a JavaScript file. There are three libraries that we import a cert, which is just you know, typical a cert library for handling uh, testing. We have our typical anchor framework provided by project serum. Uh, this is what we've been working with. And of the anchor library, we are also calling explicitly the system program that's stored in our web three module. What's neat, by the way, in Visual Studio Code, if you hit F12 on this code, it will open up the program definition. And so you can actually look into the code and see what it does. So, so very helpful if you're curious on what things do. Anyways, so to create a Mocha test, uh, essentially Mocha tests are, are defined by two things. You have describe, it's a description of your overall test. For each of the describe, you implement your it functions, and it is actually the test that we run ourselves. So each of these its are its uh, is its own individual test. There's only two in the existing one for a basic one. So what we want to do is we want to mod modify this to use our new code. Before I forget, let's open up the anchor .tomo file. We see that we have the program .local net, so that means this test is being ran in the local net or local host, um, what we want to do is we want to change our program address to be the one that we set in our declare ID macro. So we go back there, copy and paste and save. And of course, if we run anchor test, this is the command that gets ran. This is all defined for us, so we don't need to worry about it. Okay, so back to the test itself. So you can think of describe as like a class and it is the functions. So we can declare some global fields. So two global fields that were created is the provider. So the provider essentially is the, the network that we're connecting to. The Angular library provides a localhost implementation, so we don't need to worry about it. We just call it and it'll give us the provider we need. And then of course we need to set the provider. So we use it for our tests and that's done with this line of code. And so these are all global fields, so it will be reused. Uh, there are a couple of bugs already in this existing test, so we're gonna have to fix that first before it compile, before we actually try running it. Um, but back into our code, you can see that this is the exact same uh, code that we saw earlier. Uh, we create a program by using our workspace. This uh, we need to create a fake account that we want to store on the network, and that's what. Uh, and luckily for us, Anchor has a helper library that does this. It creates a key pair, and we just call it my account. And now the interesting part. So the program that we created from our workspace, we can call the RPCs that we define uh, to send our instructions over. The first thing we always need to do is we need to initialize our RPC. And so we call initialize, and this is, remember, tied to this initialize function that we defined over here. 
And inside initialize, we need to give it our arguments, the data that we sent over. Uh, in the original code, we set some data, but in this code, we actually don't. So we just get rid of this and we just send in the, the next set of parameters, which is the account data for our context. Uh, specifically, that's this initialize value. And if we look at initialize, we take in three things, my account, user, and, and system program. And so that's what we're passing in over here. So my account, uh, we just get the public key of our account uh, that we just made up. A user, which is the wallet that's going to pay for the creation of the account. In this instance, we use our provider that we define and it creates a fake wallet for us to use. And then there's system program. We just call the system program that uh, is provided for us, give it program ID and you know, don't even worry about it, honestly. We need to provide a signers for our um, Initialize, initialization and uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. We'll just you know copy and paste and just provide the your your accounts that you create to be the signer. Uh, this is the account that's to be created, and that's basically all you really need to do to send a transaction across the network to your smart contract. Pretty straightforward, honestly, especially if you come from my past videos where we talked about how we set this up. So now that we've made our initialized code and we send the tests and essentially if everything was correct, we would execute this code and we would set our data type to be zero. And so we need to retrieve that account that we set and the workspace API we use provides that type of information. Uh, we just call program accounts, my accounts, and we call fetch. We give it the key public key of the account that we're fetching. And that'll give us the account information. Uh, I want to worry too much about memorizing this. This is mostly just copy and paste. And so now we have the account data. All we need to do is just check if our uh, cert values are correct. And so we're calling account.data equals the value that we sent over, which is actually not correct. It's actually just zero. And just for a quick reference, the account.data is actually referring to this my account type that we define and it's specific data so we're directly calling this value and you might have wondered what is this new anchor.bn uh, this anchor.bn is essentially just it is anchor's way of serializing and deserializing data so what we're, this all really does is, is i believe it creates a um an object of that represents a zero uh, in the previous videos we manually created a array of bytes that represented the value and this is just a helper function that does that. So we could uh, do this comparison, I believe it'll work. But another thing I like to do, is because it, uh, all assert that okay does is tell you if this function is true or false. We don't really know the values. So what I like to do is I like to do assert that equal, and we just compare account that data with the value that we expect, which is zero. Uh, it's very important to note that if we do a, a data dot equal. Uh, if we just put a zero here, it would actually fail because that is not the type that we expected. We expected this binary format. Uh, so the comparison isn't exactly equal. Okay. And so that's all that is. And now for the final part, this is not a good testing methodology. You should not do this in real uh, tests, but you know, for the sake of time, let's just do it this way. But we then store this account that we created in a global field, and then we're going to use it for the rest of our tests. You can already see the potential recipe for disaster if tests don't run synchronously in order. Poten uh, potentially, we can increment something, decrement, and then maybe depending on the test order, we might decrement and then increment, and then the expected value is different. But anyways, so this test itself will not pass because my account is doesn't exist. We didn't define it. So to get this test to even compile, we just do let my account equals null. And so we'll set it for the first time when we call our initialize function and we'll set it at the end. And then when we call our next test, we will use it. All right, great. So that is basically how we write a test. It's very straightforward. And if we look at our update function, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, uh, we get our account that from our global field and we store it into a constant, we get our workspace. And then inside our workspace, we call our update RPC, which we defined and as you recall, Update actually does take in a custom argument, which is just a int of 64 bytes or bits. And we define that over here 
uh, it's actually very important that we have to use this anchor.bn file to generate it. Uh, the parameters the update RPC expects is not actually an integer. It expects this uh, format. It expects an anchor.bn object. Uh, so we have to use it in this format. You know, let's just set it to 100. Uh, we do the exact same. And then we define the accounts that we pass in. And just like how we define inside our update, we only define our my account. So if, uh, we do the exact same thing to populate the my account field. We just get the public key of our account. And then we fetch it the same way we fetched it earlier. And then we just do a comparison. This, uh, we could like this would pass, but uh, you know, if it fails, you don't know why that's not very helpful because the test will just tell you that we expected true and we got false. So going back to what we were doing, we can just do account.data. Is it equal to the value 100? And if it is, then it passes. But if it's not, it'll actually at least tell you what fields appeared. And so you don't have to figure out what went wrong. So now that we have our update, let's implement our increment in our decrement. So first let's call it increment. And this can be our decrement. So I just copy and paste our update. It, the code is very straightforward. It's pretty much the same thing. Instead of calling our program RPC update, we call it the increment function. We don't pass in anything because if you look back at our increment implementation, uh, we don't have any custom arguments. We just increase the count by one. And so that's exactly what we do. Uh, it takes in the same my account, so we keep everything the same. We fetch the data and we expect the value to be 101. Now, decrement is the exact same thing. We don't pass in anything. And we expect that since we are at 101 now, if we decrement it, it will be back at 100. So that's it. Uh, that's how you write your test. That's how you talk with the program. Now let's go back here and run anchor test on our terminal. And you see that it fails. Wonderful. Let's find out why. Okay. I, okay. I, I forgot to change the RPC we call it to decrement. Okay. Now we try one more time. Yeah. We don't want to do an update. We want to do a decrement. There we go. Okay. So now all of our tests are passing. And that's about as far as I want to go in this video, but I know what you're asking, how do we actually use this in real life? Uh, well, unfortunately that's, we're nearing the end of this video. In the next video, I want to see how we can integrate with phantom wallet. So actual real wallets and write code to talk to a network that we deploy locally. But before then, let's look at our TLDW. Back to our slide. So this is probably the most important uh, section of the whole video, just to see the difference between Solana and Anchor. In I just did a comparison between the old code we wrote in our previous videos and compared it with what we just written today in Anchor and see the difference. Uh, I'll just move my head away. So on the left, you see the Solana code. Uh, Solana, we have this process instruction function that we created. It, it takes in the program ID, the accounts, and the instruction data. And so to on a quick highlight, you see in the red lines, uh, we did a lot of serialization of the data. Uh, as you recall, we had to uh, take in the instruction, the arguments that we get. Uh, this would be the equivalent of each of the contexts that we send, this update, increment, and decrement. And we had to essentially parse the data with rules that we defined ourselves so we can figure out what instruction we were trying to, uh, to implement. Was this a, a increment instruction? Was it a decrement or was it a set or slash update? And of course, not even that, we also had to parse our greetings account to get the data that's in our account. But so very painful, very involved and all, everything is in one super function. Now let's look at our anchor implementation. Anchor is straightforward. We have four functions. Each function is essentially the equivalent of us handling our instruction. All the serialization and deserialization has been handled for us. That, that's just serialization and deserialization. Let's talk about the next part. Uh, in this red line, you, you see that we're actually doing a check to make sure that the account is even owned by the program. And, and so the, these are these simple checks that we have to think about every single time we write. But in Anchor, that's all abstracted away from us. They, all of this code is handled in the back end. We don't even need to do that. Uh, the sheer fact that if our code even gets executed, on, in Anchor, that implies that uh, this constraint is true. So that's on the on-chain code. Let's look at just the front-end code or just defining our accounts, actually. 
in Solana, as you recall in our videos, we had to create our account type. We had to find it on Rust, which is what you see in this picture. And we want to also use the variable on the front end in our JavaScript code. We need to define the variable again in this Java equivalent, JavaScript equivalent, but not an anchor. In anchor, we just define our account strut once and you know use it where applicable in our instructions which is this initialize update increment decrement and then that and then that would be converted into an idl file that would be read in our front end library that we saw earlier and we can just read it directly there we don't need to implement the class a second time so you see that basically eliminates any possibility of errors because you're not writing it a second time and so that's about it Hopefully this uh, video is relatively shorter in comparison to the past videos, but I highly doubt it. We'll find out. But uh, so if you found this video helpful, I greatly appreciate if you like and subscribe to my channel. Otherwise, stay tuned. Um, the next video will be about using uh, integrating our program to use uh, Phantom, uh, Phantom Wallet, to use real or you know fake Solana that we give ourselves to interact with our program. So until then, I'll catch you all later. Have a nice day.